Scott, thanks for that uh, great introduction. And good morning. It's great to be back in San Francisco. I missed last year. Uh, it's great to see so many old familiar faces and old friends. And I've had a lot of people uh, come up to me and thank me for a great meeting. And I'm on the planning committee. Um, it's a lot of hard work goes into this, but we don't have a meeting without you. So back at you. Thanks for being here and thanks for your support. And thanks for being here so, so early. So enough with the touchy-feely stuff. Uh, I actually, as Scott just said, giving uh, two lectures, and there's an incredible amount of overlap between the lectures yesterday, this morning, today, and even some of the ones tomorrow. And since um, obesity is a predominant risk factor for high spinal, I took the liberty of actually reversing the two lectures. So I'm going to actually do um, high spinal prevention and treatment first, followed by obesity and uh, cesarean delivery. I have no disclosures. And this slide is actually for our new chairman. It'll be starting in two weeks, Scott Siegel. Uh, this is Winston-Salem, and it ain't Boston, so he's got a lot of getting used to. This is the medical center in the foreground, the, the um, downtown in the background. And um, we have some claims to fame. I'll do two of them, one now and one in the next lecture. But we could actually be a Jeopardy question. And uh, what is the only city on earth that has two brands of cigarettes named after it? Uh, Alex, uh, what is Winston-Salem? So I'm not necessarily proud of it, but Scott, there's a tidbit for you. All right, objectives for this lecture is we're going to uh, examine the risk factors associated with high spinal block and then look at an evidence-based uh, approach to preventing and treating high spinal should they occur. So technically, when we do a cesarean delivery and our goal is a T4 block, if our patients develop a T3 block and say, oh, I feel like I can't breathe, well, that's a high spinal, but none of us should be really concerned about that and they don't have any problems with their airway. And yet, we wouldn't argue with the fact that if the, the block is high enough that they have muscle paralysis, unconsciousness, lose consciousness, and then can't protect the airway, that that's all something that we should be concerned about. And that happens when you have a block that's above C3. Uh, high spinal block can associate with any regional anesthetic. And because they can associate with epidurals, the proper term is actually high neuraxial block. And so when I'm discussing um, spinal-related high spinals, I'll use high spinal. But with uh, epidurals, it'll be high neuraxial block. There's a wide range in the literature, and anywhere from 1 in 2,000 to 1 in 16,000. Many of these are small case series, and it could be related to factors that they just had bad luck. Practice in that institution is hard to apply it to others. Uh, and a lot of these slides, you've already seen information in previous talks, so when that happens, I'll just kind of move forward so you know that we've done the SCORE project. Well, we've learned a lot about high spinals from the SCORE project. So we wanted to take the subjectivity of uh, defining high spinal out of it, so we used a pretty strict uh, definition. A high neuraxial block was a high block necessitating intubation and or conversion to general anesthesia. Despite this rigid um, definition, it was the most common serious complication observed in the SCORE project. We had a total of 58 high neuraxial blocks. So the incidence, not 1 in 2 or 1 in 16, but 1 in 4,000. And we could break it down further than that. So the incidence uh, related to spinal anesthesia is about 1 in 2,600. From epidurals, 1 in 9,000. So we did a lot more epidurals, but still they're 1 in 9,000 will associate with a high spinal block. And surprising to me, the numbers were about equal for spinals and epidurals that associate with a high neuraxial block. And this is something that we all should be concerned about. There still are unrecognized spinal catheters out in labor and delivery. The vast majority of them occur in labor and delivery in about one of every 12,000 epidurals. So there's been a lot of uh, risk factors as, uh, reported and associated with um, high neuraxial block. 73% of patients in the SCORE project had risk factors, and what we're really going to focus on are two of them, because 90-some percent of the patients that had risk factors, it was obesity and a spinal past a failed epidural. So you dose your epidural, it's not really working well, what do you do? You repeat a spinal in that situation, and a lot of us do that. So again, just a quick review, spinals and epidurals about 
And when we looked at risk factors associated with each of those techniques, there was something that was kind of striking, and that was that 67% of the obese, obese patients that developed a high neuraxial block, it was with dosing uh, for a cesarean delivery. So they had a pre-existing epidural. And the unrecognized catheters, 90-some percent of them happened on labor and delivery, not in the OR, which isn't surprising. We're going to actually break down prevention into two groups, the OR, cesarean delivery, and labor and delivery. And so if we focus on uh, in the OR, it's really spinal techniques that most of us do. So there's two ways uh, that you can get a high spinal block from spinal technique, and one is because you have reduced CSF volumes, Barbara alluded to that, and or we're giving too much local anesthetic for the amount of CSF volume that you have. The risk factors again, and I'll repeat them multiple times, spinals pass failed epidurals and obesity. So in order to prevent high spinal in the OR, we really have two different things that we can do. We can alter our technique, or we can manage the patients that are at risk for developing high spinal. This is from Virginia Mason uh, back in the 90s, Randy Carpenter, and did MRIs and estimated C, uh, CSF volume. And surprisingly, there's a lot of interpatient variability, and you can have as little as 40 mLs of CSF volume and as much as 80. And patients that have 80 uh, will have a, a lower than expected block, and we've all seen that where you have good aspiration before and afterwards, but they develop almost no block. It's probably related to CSF volume. And the same thing, if they have only you know, 40 mLs, you could potentially get a high spine on that situation. But what can we do about it? The only thing that we could do is to do preoperative MRIs in all of our patients, and that's not practical. And how much would that cost? And you know, you'd have to actually get thousands of MRIs to potentially find that patient with really reduced volumes, then you could alter your dose. Um, so we also know that with any of our drugs, side effects are basically um, dependent on, on the dose. So if we reduce our dose, we could potentially reduce side effects. But word of caution here, there's always unintended consequences because as you reduce the dose, you potentially will get less effect. And in this particular case, if we reduce the dose of bupivacaine, we could potentially have inadequate anesthesia for cesarean delivery, requiring potential conversion to general anesthesia. And then you may actually be bringing into play another complication, which is at a higher incidence than the high spinal. And in fact, failed intubations occur in about one in five, uh, 500. And even though Dr. Palmer said yesterday that all oh, well, you know, we're really good at it and there's no problems with it, one of the reasons that we might not see very many deaths from general anesthesia now is that the patient that would die from the general anesthetic doesn't have it because we're doing regional anesthesia. So I think, and I agree with Scott, uh, that we need to keep up the good work that we're doing and that regional is what actually does save many of these patients significant morbidity and mortality. So in America, what we typically use is hyperbaric bupivacaine and around 11 to 12 milligrams. We add fentanyl, and about half of us will add intrathecal uh, morphine. And sure enough, people have looked at reducing the dose of bupivacaine for cesarean delivery, but they don't do so to try to reduce the incidence of high spinal block. They do so to try to reduce the incidence of hypotension. And this is a good... Um, example of you can't just read the conclusions, you need to look at the studies to, to then make your own conclusions. So in this particular study, they had 60 patients, three different doses of bupivacaine, and sure enough, they found that the lower doses of bupivacaine reduced the incidence of hypotension. However, it was at a cost. There was reduced analgesia, and in fact, as many as 25% of patients in the lower groups required ketamine and diazepam. So what did they conclude? Hey, we recommend the lowest dose. It was acceptable analgesia without hypotension or bradycardia. Well, they're talking about a study of 20 patients per group. There's a million patients a year in America that have a cesarean delivery, and if 25% of them had inadequate analgesia because we reduced the dose, we're gonna potentially bring into play a lot of those patients needing to have conversion to general anesthesia after the cesarean section has already started, and now you've got that uncontrolled environment that we tried so hard to avoid. Another thing is that, yeah, hypotension is unpleasant. You can have nausea from it, but it's relatively easy, easily treated. So, you know, they, they lose context of the big picture. 
Another study, a meta-analysis, uh, didn't even compare apples and oranges. They looked at bupivacaine doses less than 10 milligrams with opioid and uh, bupivacaine without opioid that was greater than 10 milligrams, same endpoint hypertension. And they found less hypertension with the reduced doses of bupivacaine. In the bottom, they looked at inadequate analgesia. And even though the risk, the relative risk of inadequate analgesia was two and a half times higher, the conclusion was it wasn't significant. Why? For two reasons. Number one, the diamond touched the center line, and because the majority of their patients were from one study that was uh, right on, on the line, and they concluded the same thing, that the lower dose bupivacaine with opioids could decrease hypertension, and that is the preferred drug regimen for cesarean section, and I would disagree for the same reasons. Here's an excellent study that uh, comes from Stanford, and they looked at seven different doses of bupivacaine, and basically reinforces what we do in our clinical practice, and there's a reason why we do uh, what we do, and that's because it works. So the gray bars are anesthesia for incision, the dark bars are anesthesia throughout the case, and they estimated the ED95s and suggest that the ED95 of bupivacaine is actually 11.2 milligrams, which is exactly what we routinely administer. And they looked at the big picture and made a conclusion based on all of these studies. And it is the ED95 of intrathecal bupivacaine is considerably less uh, than the doses proposed for cesarean delivery in recent publications. When doses less than ED95 are used, these doses should be administered as part of a catheter-based technique. And we're going to use that as a solid foundation for the rest of this lecture. Basically, if you're going to do a spinal in the high-risk patients, why not do a lower dose? And if you do have inadequate analgesia, have that catheter as a backup. Um, so the incidence, can, you know, part of the lecture title is, can we prevent it? I'm not sure that we really can. The incidence is really low to start with, and the only way that we could reduce it is to get our MRIs and everybody or alter our technique so that we're doing a CSC for all of the elective cesarean deliveries, and I think that that's uh, also um, not really practical, and I, and I don't want to do it, especially for a lot of us that work in really uh, places that do a lot of fast surgery. So the, the second alternative is can we manage the risk factors? And throughout the lectures today, uh, we'll talk about minimizing risk, maximizing benefits. For everything that we do, that should be in the back of your mind, and that's what I try to teach residents all the time. So patients at risk in the OR again are spinals when you have the uh, failed epidurals and obese patients. And so what do you do? You do a thorough history and physical exam, airway exam. Have they had difficulty with the intubation in, in the past, and do you anticipate that airway to be difficult? If you have a good airway, then you proceed and you do the spinal. Um, and, and in fact, I had a patient, and we'll talk about her later, but she was over 400 pounds, but she was tall. She had a class one airway, one shot spinal. She said, I can't breathe, and progressed to develop a high spinal. She was easy intubation. If you anticipate a bad innovation, then here's what you do. You do it different. You either repeat the epidural rather than doing a spinal, or you do what they suggested at Stanford, which is you reduce your dose of bupivacaine to five or seven and a half milligrams, and you do it as part of a catheter-based technique. But then you have patients with the really, really bad airways. So in them, you have other options. You can consider an awake innovation and just tackle that airway. Um, again with the epidural or the, the CSC, but you also can consider a continuous spinal catheter, which we'll discuss later on. So I don't think that, uh, so it can't be prevented 100%, so one of the take-home messages of this lecture is that you have to always be prepared to treat a high spinal block. Well, in the OR, it's relatively easy. You have your intubating equipment right there. You have your difficult intubation equipment really available. You have a surgeon right there. But labor and delivery is a little bit of a different story. So the causes uh, on, on labor is unrecognized spinal catheters and concentrated local anesthetic, and that's really when you're dosing for cesarean delivery. What's the risk factor? It's really just obesity, and there weren't any, any uh, patterns that appeared from the 13 uh, unrecognized spinal catheters. It can happen in any patient. So to prevent high neuraxial block on labor and delivery, we have to identify spinal catheters, and we have to manage risk factors, the obese patients who require cesarean delivery. 
One of the things that we found in the SCORE project, and it just confirmed what we already knew, that modern obstetric anesthesia for labor is unbelievably safe. There were very few complications. We, you know, 160,000 um, deliveries that, that had uh, labor epidurals, very safe. And we can attribute that to Dr. Albright, who brought to attention that concentrated local anesthetics, clear back in 1979, were leading to significant maternal mortality and morbidity, and it changed the way that we practice. We test epidural catheters, we use fractionated dosing, and we've now developed and, and found that we can use ultra-low dose uh, for labor analgesia. Made it unbelievably safe. So we administer um, test doses to rule out intrathecal or IV catheters, and there's a lot of different tests that you can do, and we don't have time to go over all of them. It probably doesn't matter as long as you're testing catheters. The important note is that no method's 100% safe. Now, this is two studies by Dr. Norris that were published in the late 90s, and he had 110 IV catheters, and he was able, by just aspiration, to identify 107 of them. It's not 100%. And despite that, he concluded that because aspiration alone detected almost all of them, that maybe we don't need a test dose. Well, that last article was accompanied by an editorial that basically said there is no substitution for careful observation, vigilance, and sound judgment, that careful aspiration followed by an appropriate test dose increases the likelihood that an intrathecal or IV catheter will be detected and that will potentially avoid a catastrophe. And I think that that is um, a sound recommendation that has also been supported by the, the findings in the SCORE project. And, you know, one in 12,000 doesn't sound like a lot, but there's two million women in America that receive labor epidural. So if you do the math, that's going to be 162 unrecognized spinal catheters and potentially doing that general aspiration, the test dose is going to capture almost all of them. And does this really happen? Well, in the closed claims data, yes, it does. And unrecognized spinal catheters and complications from that um, leads to lawsuits. So, a labor and delivery, test every catheter for intrathecal or intravenous insertion. After it's placed, simply hold the hub below the level of the insertion site. If it's intrathecal or, or IV, you should see blood or cerebrospinal fluid general aspiration followed by some kind of test dose. I don't care what you do. That probably will make it safer. The other stuff is don't, remember, don't forget the lessons learned from Dr. Albright. Never administer um, large boluses as, as a bolus. So you can quickly give somebody 20 mLs, and we'll talk about techniques um, in the next part of the lecture uh, for cesarean delivery that's emergent, but five mLs at a time. Maintain verbal contact with the patient and when in doubt, pull it out. If you don't have a block, it's IV until proven otherwise. So for cesarean delivery, you still have to use concentrated local anesthetic, and again, it's the obese patient. So if you're not already dosing all patients for cesarean delivery in the OR, at least take your obese patients and do that in the OR, and that will make it safer because that's where your um, difficult airway equipment is. But similar to the OR, we probably can't prevent high spinal or high neuraxial blocks on labor delivery totally. So be prepared to treat it, which is trickier on labor and, labor and delivery. You're not near the OR. You don't have your equipment really available. So make that so. In every labor room, you should have an AMBU, an oxygen readily available. And do you have a tackle box or difficult airway equipment on labor and delivery? What about a Gladscope? Now, they cost a lot, and we really aren't going to use it very often, so I'm not sure it's really cost effective to have a glide scope on labor and delivery, but the tackle box and the tracheal tube, laryngoscope, it's really easy to do, and do you have that? The next thing, which you're going to hear more about later today and tomorrow, is practice drills. Do the nurses know where this is? Do all the anesthesia providers know where this stuff is? And is it actually stocked and up to date? So on, on our labor unit, every bed has a AMBU right next to the bedside, and I do walk through and check and make sure that they're there. Oxygen, we have that tackle box there, and everything's labeled. We make sure that nothing's expired. And then you, know, you can see the intralipid there, and just an important note, I don't administer intralipid very often, even though I do the lecture, I can't remember the doses. Everything is labeled easy to follow, easy instructions in an emergency. I don't have time to think, I just want to do. It. 
So in summary, uh, high neuroaxial blocks are rare, about one in 4,000, but it's the most serious complication that we encounter in obstetric anesthesia. It's about 50-50 spinals and epidurals, and there still are unrecognized spinal catheters on labor and delivery. We probably can't prevent it, high neuroaxial blocks, but we can minimize the risks. The risk factors in the OR are um, spinals after a failed epidural and obese patients, and on labor and delivery, it's the unrecognized spinal catheters and obese patients. So test all epidural catheters after insertion, do a thorough airway exam in those high-risk patients, and in the OR, either repeat the epidural or do a CSC with a reduced dose of bupivacaine. On labor, labor and delivery, if you're not already doing so, uh, dose patients, obese patients for cesarean delivery in the OR. Consider a spinal catheter for the highest risk airways and most important of all, always be prepared to treat, have airway equipment readily available. It's time we face reality, my friends. We're not exactly rocket scientists and this stuff's a lot of common sense. It's not rocket science. Thank you.